continue where we left off uh, last time. We were uh, discussing the, um, the structure of what we call uh, conventional uh, hot strip mills, where we uh, make a uh, hot rolled strip. And uh, we were looking at uh, two configurations. A uh, first mm -hmm. configuration here is what I would call a uh, traditional configuration. Yes. Um, so you have um, your uh, reheating furnaces, yes, uh, where you insert the, the slabs, yes. They come out heated. You go through a first roughing mill, yes. Uh, you know that the, uh, the slab, after it's been rolled out in the roughing mill, is called a bar, right? Uh, and, and then you go into the finishing mill, hmm? anywhere up to seven stands, not unusual. Hmm? Uh, the um, cooling of the strip is in the runout table, and then you have coilers. Yes. Um, so this is a schematic here. The uh, the distances can be quite large. In particular, uh, this distance here. So the uh, when you when you have your the bar, hmm? you can see here this is about 120 meters. Yeah. And the uh, cooling here is, is, we'll discuss this in more detail, this is what's called laminar cooling, yes. This distance here is also very, very long. This is here about, in this uh, setup, about 180 meters, right? Good. Um, another uh, uh, configuration is uh, more compact. And this is achieved by the use of a coil box. Mm -hmm. And in the coil box, uh, the, uh, you make sure that your transfer bar is thin enough, yes, thin enough, so it can, it can be coiled, yes? And, um, and then when the finishing mill is available, it can be uncoiled and enters the finishing mill for the, uh, the final uh, cooling. Uh, for the final rolling and cooling then. Hmm? Um, the um, advantage, we'll, we'll discuss the advantages of the coil box, but uh, you can see that one of the things that happens is, is instead of having a, a bar that's about 100 meters that's laid out in open, you now have the same material is coiled up, yes, is in a compact shape, so the temperature is very homogeneous and the temperature losses are very limited, yes? In addition to this, uh, you need all this space, yes? You don't need these, these hundreds of, this 120 meter of um, distance uh, because you can all, you know, this, the, the bar gets coiled, hmm? all right? So, um, we'll also see that this is an expensive uh, choice. Um, there are continuously uh, improvements in uh, these, um, the design of hot strip mills. Uh, hot strip mills have typically, you know, uh, will be in operations for many decades. And over the years, the equipment will change and uh, there will be you know, constant improvements. And um, we have some interesting, and I'll, we'll go through them in more detail uh, when, when we are discussing the hot strip mill stage by stage. The, uh, some of these modern um, equipment and control and controls that are being put into uh, place are walk, so-called walking beam furnaces instead of uh, pusher beam, pusher uh, furnaces. Um, descaling at very high pressures, water pr uh, pressures. There's a big effort in width control, yes, that allows you to make more dimensions, more variety in the dimension of your strip. Box is uh, 
uh, important investment in certain cases where uh, temperature control is, is vital. Um, and then uh, you even have what's called a coil recovery furnace where the, we, you actually have active temperature control of the, of the coil. In the, uh, in the finishing mill, um, there is what's called roll bending and roll shifting uh, equipment is being installed very often. That is to control the strip profile, to make sure we'll, 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 have, we'll devote a whole lecture on, on strip profile. It's to make sure that you have uh, basically the right shape of the, uh, the strip. Hmm? What, uh, or what we call profile. Um, you probably think that uh, when you roll a, a sheet material, uh, the thickness is, is the same everywhere. Hmm? Well, well, it isn't. It isn't. There are, and you may not want it to be the same everywhere either, um, as we will see. Uh, but um, the, the, the shape is actually uh, a little bit like this. Thicker in the middle and thinner at the edge, yes? Uh, so, and, uh, and you want to, to, to control this within extremely low um, tolerances. You know, we're talking about control at the level of, you know, tens of microns, yes? This is not control over, uh, over millimeters anymore. So um, this in involves uh, this technology of bending and shifting of the rolls. Lubrication and cooling is important. Um, in the, uh, the cooling here on the runout table is very important uh, because that's where you have your transformations. So it's a very essential step to uh, create the microstructures that you want hmm? or an intermediate microstructure that you want. So um, the cooling pattern is very important. So the, uh, there's a lot of effort in controlling the cooling pattern and also having variable uh, cooling widths. And finally, uh, coilers are important. And with the increase of uh, production, you may want to uh, you, you see that uh, in, in productivity, rather, uh, people are using larger coils, yes, and hence uh, the need for power uh, coilers. Okay, so let's start at, our, um, at the beginning here uh, with the reheating furnaces. You already know that we have, uh, uh, we use slabs for uh, flat products. Hmm? They have rectangular shapes, they're used for flat products, and usually 60 centimeters or more. And we, you could say that the width is large and then three times the thickness minimum. And for other products, in particular long products, we will use blooms, yes? And uh, for uh, bar products and wire products, we'll see billet testers and uh, billets. Hmm? So t today we are talking about this kind of uh, slabs where uh, to start as starting material. The uh, let's say a few things about the uh, uh, the quality of slabs. Um, so um, depends it, the quality depends very much on your caster, and there are uh, a lot of uh, different uh, varieties of caster have been used or and are, in, uh, are still in use. You have casters where you basically pour uh, vertically and then you have casters where you have a, a, a curved caster basically. Hmm? So let's have a look at uh, how we um, uh, identify these, uh, the casters in, uh, on the base of their mold, yes. You can have vertical casters and curved casters. So what's, what's the big difference, yeah, is that uh, in this case, yes, the uh, curving starting to, to bend the, uh, 
the material happens after you it's solidified basically in in, uh, in 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 these cases here on the right you have the bending and the solidification happen at the same time so so the strand the, the strand this is what we call uh, this uh, continuous uh, uh, metal here um, is uh, so there's no bending in the case in this case here you you never bend you cut off uh, the slab <coughs> when it's uh, vertical yeah, after it's solidified you can have uh, a vertical caster yes where you do the bending after the solidification and then you have a whole set of variants on the uh, bending with uh, during solidification and this this bending can be see for instance in this case uh, and in this case here yes you have you progressively increase the radius of bending hmm? uh, why would we do this well um, obviously um, there are economic reasons to have equipment that of this nature than of this nature. You can see that the size of the um, uh, equipment will be much larger, yes, and that uh, there'll be materials handling problems because you'll have to get the, the slab from its vertical position to a horizontal position, right? So uh, a very important investment cost. However, yes, in terms of quality, yes, uh, surface defects, etc., um, it's a little better because you don't have bending and unbending of the slabs at any time. Yes? And um, metallurgical center line is well defined. What's the metallurgical center line? That's where the, uh, uh, the, um, the material ends its solidification. It will be in the middle of the slab. Whereas in this case, as you bend the material, yes, uh, you know, once during the bending, on one side you have uh, uh, slightly less surface than on the other side. So you will uh, uh, move the uh, the metallurgical center line to the interior, to towards the the side where you do the bending. Hmm? Uh, and of course you 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 bend the strip and then you bend the strip in one direction here and then you unbend it when you flatten it again yeah so um, you can have surface defects and uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, well we can we can talk about this here yeah so so the the slabs yes that you get I want to point, uh, uh, get your attention uh, to this particular picture, right? So they're about 25 centimeter in width, uh, in thickness, about one meter or more in uh, width, usually. Um, this width will define, uh, or, or is uh, set, the maximum width is set by the hot strip mill dimensions, in particular what we call the backup roll dimensions, yes? And uh, they're pretty much defined or determined by the requirements, the product width requirements. Now, when you look at this slab here, you can already see that when we say a slab temperature is 1,000 degrees or 1,250 degrees, we have to be careful because it's never very homogeneous. Yes? So you can see here the edges are cooling down much faster than... Uh, obviously the center part of this uh, slab here. Hmm? Um, what, um, w when uh, talking about hot strip mills, uh, uh, people like to uh, refer to the, the length of the slabs, hmm? the longer the uh, higher the productivity or the higher production, uh, yearly production will be. Um, and they also use pounds per inch width uh, value to describe the, uh, the, 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 uh, the productivity that uh, um, a, strip, a hot strip mill typically gets. 
um, just for your information, um, the, um, the PIW, or pounds per inch width, value um, is interesting because it's interesting uh, measure for uh, production because say you have a slab here of about 12 meters and if I cut off one millimeter or one inch in this case uh, uh, for pounds per uh, uh, inch width yes yes um, after uh, when it's in the bar form yes uh, if I cut off one millimeter or if it's in the coiled form and I cut off one millimeter yes that value is always the same yes mm -hmm. so it tells us something about the typical uh, slab or coil size that you can produce mm -hmm. um, Right, so, so and, and why is this important? Because it's, it tells us something about the, the, the design of the mill, uh, because if the, design, the, the mill design will determine what the, the maximum coil size will be, mm -hmm. and again, uh, it's, it's determined by the width of your um, uh, width of the backup rolls. And so we use this, this uh, specific coil weight in kilos per millimeters or the PIW, pounds per inch width, uh, in North America. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically length times the thickness, a thickness here, times uh, a density, yeah? density factor. The 12 here refers to the length of the, of the slab, by the way. And you may want to write this in your notes because when I was looking at it, uh, so the 12 here is not, it's just the length of the slab, right? So, okay, so you can convert uh, these things. So if you have um, a thousand uh, pounds per, per inch, yes, uh, that means that uh, uh, this is about 500 kilograms per, and this is 2.5 2 uh, millimeters, so 50, 500 divided by 25, that is 20 kilograms per millimeter. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, what, that's the specific coil weight uh, in, 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 uh, in decimals. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, so if you have a, uh, a, a typical um, hot strip mill today has a, a PIW value that's slightly higher than these, these thousand uh, pounds per inch or 20 kilos per millimeter. And that tells you something about the size of, the, of, your, uh, of your mill in terms of how, how big uh, coils, how big the size of the coils, how big the, the slabs are. Good, so uh, with the slabs, mm, you have uh, many, uh, in practice, many quality problems which are related to surfaces and, in, and the interior of the, the slabs. Mm. And in particular, uh, you have uh, cracks and crack-like features which can, uh, as you process the slab, become very large, surface problems, hmm? uh, and you can even have slabs that barely break on you. Hmm? Um, and there are some procedures called hot charging, where in order to avoid uh, the, the cracking of a slab, you will do hot charging. Hot charging is uh, a procedure whereby you don't let the slab uh, cool to room temperature, but keep it at a, an intermediate temperature in a special furnace, yes, uh, so that uh, it doesn't break. There, there are some um, steel grades which are very sensitive to hot cracking, in particular uh, high silicon steels, which will typically uh, steels that contain 3% of silicon uh, are known to be very sensitive to hot cracking. 
One of the reasons is that uh, these steels, when, they, uh, when you cool them down, they uh, form intermetallic compounds, yes, ordered compounds, hmm? which are very brittle, yes. And uh, so in order to avoid formation of these compounds, you, you will do hot charging. Hmm? Um, right, so you can have longitudinal cracks on your material, transverse cracks, you can have segregation problems, yes. Uh, you can have op open center lines, you know, local uh, cracking. You very often have oscillation marks, which are uh, mold marks on the, uh, on the slabs. S uh, heat checks from s scarfing. What is scarfing? Um, when uh, you have very high requirements for the surface, um, sometimes the surface layer is totally removed, either mechanically or with a torch, burned off with a torch. And um, so that has to be, that's very often done manually, and uh, uh, so this has to be done nicely, otherwise you get uh, scarfing related defects. Curves, that these are just marks, mechanical marks, uh, uh, that's because the steel is very soft, yes, handling damage. Uh, can break slabs and uh, certain uh, high carbon and, and high low grades uh, are, have other additional problems. Mm -hmm. So here are a number of examples. Here you see these oscillation marks at the surface of the slab. So every mark uh, corresponds to one movement of the, the copper mold. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, center line segregation here, edge cracks, mm -hmm. So, and uh, very often, so related to uh, the operation of the, uh, the continuous caster. Why are these surface cracks, however small they are, so important? Hmm? Well, say for instance, you have a small surface crack on your slab. Hmm? So, um, of course, the material is subject to oxidation, yes? And uh, so the, the, the corners here are rounded off, yes. The, and when you, uh, 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 and, and also the oxidation makes the crack uh, deeper, yes. But as you um, uh, roll this out, yes, mm -hmm. what, what tends to happen is that um, the, uh, the crack is rolled into the material, yes, and, and closed. Yes, and that can be very efficient. So you you hardly see this this crack anymore. Yes, and uh, basically it disappears into the surface, yes. and underneath uh, if, or in between the and, and the closed crack, as it were, has is a small film of scale or oxide in the interior. Yes, and these these defects will show up um, very late. Um, when uh, at a very late stage in the production or even at the customer when, when they're doing a stamping or something. So uh, control of uh, surface quality, very important. Mm -hmm. And here you see some major uh, cracks, uh, center line crack. And here this is a crack that's actually opened when, you did, when the rough rolling is, is being done. Um, here you say uh, uh, scarfing. Uh, material that's left over, hanging over this edge, that will all create surface defects. Um, in terms of the internal quality, yes, what happens when the um, the material is solidified in the mold, yes, mm -hmm. and and uh, so in inside your slab, at the at the mold surface, yes, we have equiaxed. Uh, crystals are formed, and then in the interior part you get dendritic growth because of the uh, lower um, heat transfer. Yes, and as a consequence, hmm, the last regions that will solidify will contain more impurities. Yes, so the, the material is not homogeneously chemically homogeneous. Hmm? Okay, and um, one of the things. That, uh, that you do first, yes, is uh, 
in the uh, in the um, reheating step and in the roughing step is re-established a homogeneous microstructure and a homogeneous composition. Yes, and you do that at high temperatures, and you do this with the reheating furnace. So we're here at the very beginning of the uh, uh, the uh, hot strip mill with the reheating furnace. We have we enter the slabs here, and uh, so we we need to start at about 1250 to 1300 degrees C. So try to remember this. These are important temperatures. Um, and, and we'll see that at, at this temperature, many uh, you get many um, um, interesting microstructural changes happening to the material. Hmm? Um, this temperature has to be high enough because you need to handle the material, roll it, go through the roughing mill and the finishing mill, and that has to be done fully in the austenitic uh, 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 microstructure. Hmm? So that means that this end temperature here will be around a little bit less than 900 degrees C, eight in the range of 850 to 900 degrees C. So you, you have to end in that, in that window of temperatures. Hmm? Okay, and, and of course, as you go from here to here, there is no additional heating. Yes? So you need to start at temperatures that are high enough, but not too high and see why they cannot be too high. Hmm? So we have uh, different types of furnaces to do this. We have what's called, uh, the traditional ones are the, the pusher type furnaces. The more modern uh, plants use walking beam furnaces. And we also have reheating furnaces w which are called tunnel furnaces. They're different from, they're not used in conventional um, hot strip mills, they're used in uh, mini mills and we'll talk about them separately we, when we talk about alternative hot strip mills. Um, right, and you have um, in the, uh, in the furnace we have different zones, yes, uh, typically three zones, yes, and the slabs rest on uh, internally steam cooled rails which we call kids and they leave skid marks on our uh, slabs how do we heat it we heat with heavy oil or LPG we don't use by don't use electricity the reason is cost uh, using heavy oil or LPG cost about a third of electricity we have three uh, zones Zone number one, we do a preheating to 600 degrees. The second one is the actual heating to 12, 1250 to 1300, yes, or 1200 to, that's the typical range, but the actual range in practice is much closer to this, 1250, yeah, to uh, 1300. And then we have a soaking zone in your uh, reheating uh, furnace where you homogenize the slab. Yeah? What happens uh, in the furnace? Well, we're heating in atmospheric conditions, so we get scale formation. That's basically another word for oxidation, thermal oxidation. So that gives you a loss in yield, of course, cost in uh, removing the scale, and cost in recycling the scale. Whether or not and how much scale you form depends on the steel composition. You cannot do much about this, of course. The heating temperature, so you, this is one of the reasons why you'd rather go to low temperature than high temperatures. The heating time, hmm? and the furnace atmosphere, which can be uh, controlled. You could, for instance, think about reducing the oxygen content in the, in the furnace. Hmm? So let's have a look at the, the different uh, furnaces. So we have pusher type and walking beam furnaces. Um, so we try to obtain slabs which have this temperature and uniformly at this temperature. 
they come most of the time, except when you do hot charging, in the furnace at ambient temperature, so room temperature, and, um, and we heat to this uh, temperature. What is the time of residence in the, um, in the furnace? It's two and a half hours. That's typical, yeah? pretty much an industry standard. Yeah? And, and the heating capacity is, of course, also important. Yes? You need, uh, typical heating capacity is 300 tons per hour. So, um, so you need to have a furnace that has the right dimension so you can heat, homogeneously heat these slabs at the rate of about 300 tons per hour. Hmm? Um, here just a remark for the uh, researchers amongst you. The, because very often you will see students doing research and then they, they're uh, uh, simulating uh, uh, the uh, reheating or the hot rolling process, uh, you don't have to heat for two and a half hours your materials, right? The reason why you do this with the slabs, yes, is because they're so massive, yes? A small specimen doesn't take that long to heat up, right? Okay. Sometimes you see this, students will then take a small, tiny sample and heat it for two and a half hours saying, oh, what, you know, I need to do it the same way it's being done in industry. Uh, uh, that's not necessary. Um, there are other things you should look at uh, when, when you choose a reheating time. Maybe we'll say a few words about this. So let's see um, uh, these, uh, these furnaces. So you have a pusher type furnace. Hmm? Here you have some numbers for a pusher type furnace. Hmm? Um, the zones, you have three zones. Yeah? A, um, a first zone here. Well, this one has five, so five zones. But, uh, what I meant is you have a zone, a first zone here, which is called is the preheat zone or the convection zone. Then you have the the actual heating zone, yes, and then you have the uh, soaking or equalizing zone where the, uh, the temperature is being homogenized. Hmm? So what happens is your slabs come here, yes, and this machine here, the pusher, just pushes this slab inside the furnace, yes, and uh, all the other previously loaded uh, slabs are uh, pushing against each other. So when you push one in, you push one out on this side. Hmm? Okay, and this one is has the high the, the right temperature to start being rolled. Hmm? Okay, and you have burners with open flames. Yeah. Okay, in a walking beam furnace, uh, we again have. Uh, now the ent entry is this side, right? We have a preheat, a heating, and a soaking zone, again. Um, the difference between a walking beam furnace and a uh, pusher type furnace is that in the pusher type furnace, the, so the, uh, so, so here you have a pusher, yes? Our uh, uh, slab lies on skids. Basically, these are just uh, steam-cooled pipes, yes, and they basically rub over this. They're being pushed over these skids, yes. In the case of a walker beam furnace, yeah, a walking beam furnace, um, the slabs don't touch each other, yes. They sit, so uh, yeah, this, yeah, this is the, they sit in line, yes. They, of course, s sit on um, skids, but, yes, uh, we have a, uh, a walking uh, 
I'm, I'm doing it very simply here, right? Uh, a walking mechanism that will lift, lift up this slab, yes, and put it in, the, in this position. So it goes up, ro walks it over, push, puts it down, yes? And it does the same with all the slabs at the same time. So you, the slabs are lifted, moved, and put down, yes? That's, walk, that's the walking. The advantage here is that um, the slabs don't rub against each other, yes? The, and they don't, uh, you don't push them over these, uh, these pipes, these skids. Um, right, you have to imagine you have these, these skids uh, and you have like a 20 ton uh, slab lying on them so that will leave marks yes and the, and the material at 1250 is very soft yes it may be steel but at 1200 degrees C it's a soft material yeah okay so uh, walking beam furnaces are good for quality reasons yes surface quality uh, reasons the, uh, uh, let's have a look at the, the heating of the slab inside one of the, uh, a, in slab um, of a, uh, a reheating furnace. So uh, if, if we use natural gas, and that's used very often, the main constituent is methane, hmm? CH4. That's our energy source, yes? And we use air to burn this gas and generate heat, basically. And so we have gas, big gas burners, and the, the methane is, uh, is oxidized by air to form water vapor, CO2. Of course, you heat up a lot of nitrogen, yes, and, and heat. Mm -hmm. The flame heats up the refractory, heats up, uh, and of course, you have uh, gases, combustion gases, and that will heat up the slab. Now, about this here, um, for uh, natural gas, the, the exact ratio uh, of, for combustion is about 10 volumes of air for one volume of gas. Yes? And that will give me a flame temperature of about 1990 degree C. Mm -hmm. I can have an excess air, yes? yeah. and that's 12 volumes, for instance, of, with one volume of gas, that gives me 1800 degrees C. So it's lower because <coughs> I need to heat up. I lose some of the heat to heat up uh, unoxidized, un unreacted oxygen and nitrogen of the air. And I can also have uh, an excess of natural gas, uh, eight volumes, for instance, of air to one volume of gas. And there the temperature will be lower also. Okay, uh, around 1810. Hmm? The, um, wh why would we do this? Well, in this case, there is no excess of oxygen. Yes, there's no high temperature oxygen. So uh, my, the, the, form, the formation of scale at the surface can be reduced. Hmm? What about heat transfer itself? How much of the heating, the, the heat that we generate uh, goes to uh, the steel, well, about 70%. Mm -hmm. the, um, we don't put the flame of the gas burner on the slab, yes? Never do this, yes? We, it's, it's, um, uh, it's indirect heating. You heat the refractories of the uh, furnace, yeah? and, and so you get radiation heating, and you get convection heating from the hot gases that will heat the slab. You don't put this high flame on the slab, high temperature flame on the slabs. So the temperature, yes, in the, in the furnace um, is like this. So in the, the preheating zone, this is the gas temperature. That's going to be the highest temperature. The wall temperature is uh, slightly lower. And the slab, as we heat up, as we heat up this very large amount of 
is a very massive, massive amount of steel uh, will slowly heat up. And by the end of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the heating, yes, and the, this, the, these uh, furnace is about 40 meters long, yes, um, you will have homogeneous temperatures. And then you can offload the, uh, the slab onto the line. Okay, so we've talked about uh, something about the, the, the before I go on I, I, with this. Right, no. Oh. Um, what, what happens to the material when, we, um, when it's being heated up to this temperature range? Yes? In particular with the microstructure. Yeah? Uh, well, one of the things that happens is you get massive grain growth. Massive grain growth. Hmm? You know, typically uh, when you, um, uh, steel products will have grain sizes can range from seven to eight microns to 20 microns. Rarely do you see much larger grain sizes unless we're talking about, for instance, electrical steels, hmm? where, where you can have very large grain sizes. In general, uh, we don't have large grain sizes. So, so what happens? Um, well, let's look at the grain size as a function of the reheating temperature yes, of a conventional carbon manganese steel. So, it's, so for instance, a steel uh, uh, S275, for instance. Right? It's structural steel, yes. Um, to reheat this uh, slab of this material, what you see is that the grain size slowly increases, increases, increases. And by the time you're in this range, that's the typical reheating temperature, your grain size is about 300 microns or thereabouts. Now, if, so, so basically what happens is, uh, uh, you know, uh, you get uh, grain growth, yes? Now, um, you can, of course, you, you know that one of the things you, you will want is not to have this high, large grain size. So you're gonna want to reduce this grain size. Mm -hmm. And there are elements that you can add to steel to reduce the grain size. And um, why do they do this? Is because they form very fine precipitates. And these precipitates, like the black ones here, will prevent the grains from moving. Hmm? And this way prevent grain growth. Yes? However, yes, uh, most of the time, it doesn't work. Hmm? Or it's not very efficient. Because uh, these little particles, or these little precipitates, have their own solubility. Yes? So at high temperature, they become more soluble. So as you um, uh, increase the temperature um, and these particles go into solution, the grain growth will suddenly uh, pick up. Hmm? So if, say, for instance, um, vanadium and niobium. We've talked about these elements because they form small precipitates, small carbides or carbonitrides. Yes? We see that when we heat these grades up in a, in a reheating furnace, um, their grain size remains low for a long time, but then suddenly increases because the vanadium precipitates go into solution. So the, uh, the grain um, boundaries are free to move, yes, and the grain size will uh, will increase very quickly. Mm -hmm. Aluminum forms aluminum nitride at around uh, typical compositions at around 1100. All the aluminum nitride goes into solution and the grain size there also explodes. The same with niobium, albeit at a slightly higher temperature as you can see. The only precipitate who appears to uh, be very efficient in keeping the grain growth under control is the addition of titanium. And that is because titanium nitride has a very low solubility. 
yes? Very low solubility in the solid, in, in austenite, uh, solid austenite. So even at 1250, it doesn't go into solution, yes? And it, uh, it prevents, it pins the grain boundaries and prevents grain growth. Of course, what I've just said depends on many things. Hmm? For instance, it will depend on the, for instance, where this occurs, the, the grain growth for a niobium grade will depend on how much niobium is in solution. Hmm? It, it, sorry, the, the, how much niobium you have added to your steel. So let's say, for instance, you compare the grain growth kinetics in the reheating furnace for a 100 ppm niobium steel, a 500 ppm niobium steel, and a 1,000 ppm niobium steel. For these different compositions, you have different temperature at which the niobium carbide will be in solution. Yes? And so that's also what you see, uh, that uh, if you have very low niobium, 100 ppm of niobium, the grain growth starts at about 1,000 degrees. Yeah? However, if you have 10 times more niobium, yes, 1,000 ppm, the grain growth is postponed until a temperature that's close to 1,200 degrees C. Yes? And the reason is because the niobium uh, uh, carbide doesn't go suddenly and fully into solution, but gradually. And of course, the more niobium carbide precipitates you have, um, the more they will be, uh, the, the longer they will stand, uh, prevent grain, grain growth uh, at higher temperature. So, so the grain size is controlled by the temperature at which the precipitation is fully dissolved. That's the important temperature. Okay, um, so there is also a temperature and a time dependence. Hmm? For instance, in, in this case, we're looking at the, a time dependence, yes? Okay, so say we look at uh, a, a specific steel which contains about 500 ppm aluminum and 17 ppm of nitrogen. This is a very common amount of aluminum and nitrogen in steels, yes? Uh, the aluminum will form aluminum nitride, yes? yes? So you'll have, and as you heat the material at, for instance, 950, yes? What you see is that uh, with time, you have a very almost non-existent increase in the grain size. Hmm? However, as I increase the temperature, this is, say, I, I don't heat up to this temperature, but I heat up to 11, uh, 1050, yes, for a change, yes. What I see is that the aluminum nitride should be going into solution fully. At this temperature, it's fully in solution, yeah. Uh, it should be in, in fully in solution, but it takes time for the aluminum nitride to dissolve, yes? And it, t it takes about, typically, nine hours at this temperature to be fully dissolved and, um, and allow for grain growth, yes? What about 1150? Here, the aluminum nitride, you can see, uh, dissolves very quickly at less than uh, one hour, and you see this in this very uh, large increase in the grain size at the temperature. Yeah? So the typical times we use, uh, residence time of a slab in, the re in a reheating furnace is, I told you, it's about two and a half hours. So you can see that in that case, yes, uh, we will very quickly dissolve the aluminum nitride. Fully. Hmm. Good. So that's for the what happens at the level of microstructure. 
very big grains, unless you've added titanium nitride. Hmm? By, by making titanium addition. We, the other thing that you will get in, on the slab is uh, scale formation. Hmm? And we call this scale in the reheating, we call this primary uh, scale. Hmm? And it, the oxide layer is actually consists of different layers itself. There is a top layer of hematite, there is a middle layer of magnetite, and a, a bottom layer. Oh, this is interesting. So you, this should be, this is not top layer, this should be the, the layer that's in contact with the, the steel. Uh, right, so um, uh, this uh, This is a very dense layer, and it, is, it has good thermal conductivity. Yeah. This is a porous layer, and has poor th uh, thermal conductivity, and FeO is also porous and is, is very insulating. Yes. So these uh, oxides will, will have an impact on heat transfer, and, and therefore on the cooling uh, of your, your slab. Uh, there are also some holes in these... Uh, um, oxides, which are usually CO2 or SO2, hmm? and very often we get delamination of these, this oxide. As you cool down, the um, uh, oxide delaminates. Now, um, usually the, the growth of the oxide is temperature and time dependence, dependent, and it goes as a square root of the time according to theory. In practice, it's not a very useful uh, approach. What are these uh, primary scale uh, layers like? Well, they're very thick. They are two to three millimeters on uh, a typical slab. And this uh, should be compared with what we call process or secondary scale. Yes, That's the, the scale that's formed on your strip when you process it in the hot strip mill. Because in the hot strip mill, you're still in, 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 uh, at high temperature. Yeah. And, and there, the, the thickness is about 0.1 to 0.25 millimeters. Hmm? So we lose a lot of iron to oxidation. Right? The scale formation should always be minimized because there's a, a cost associated with it. And it's, it's, not, it's not small. Hmm? You're, you're talking about fifty to $100,000 uh, per year. Hmm? So uh, let's have a look at the, uh, the formation of this, pri this primary uh, scale. It's a function of temperature, time, and of course, what the conditions in our furnace, whether or not uh, we have an excess of oxygen. So um, this is the, the kinetics. This is in pounds per square feet. This uh, one pound per square feet is about uh, five kilos per square meters. Hmm? So this would be, this, this corresponds to about two kilos per square meter. Hmm? This band here. So uh, we hold the slab, I rem want to remind you, for two to two and a half hours at the reheating temperature. So the amount that we make in this time yes, depends very much on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the more uh, we make. Yeah? So you can see here we, we make about two kilos per square meter of scale um, uh, after two and a half uh, hours in, uh, at, at 1200 degrees C. And if we increase the temperature, it can, be, it, it can easily double yeah, if you go about 150 degrees higher. And of course, any excess air will increase this rate of scale formation. Hmm? The uh, um, furnace width is about 10 to uh, about 10 meters wide, and so you push the slabs 
through the furnace in, in this manner, right? And they, in a, a pusher type furnace. And so they, they sit on these pipes, yes? And um, because these are, they're very hot, but they're still cooler than the slab, yes? They, there is a, a cooling effect, a, a local cooling effect. So not only do you have a, uh, you rub the slab on the skid pipe, you also cool it locally. So that gives you uh, a, an effect that, uh, a thermal effect that actually stays with the, the material all through the hot strip mill uh, processing. Mm -hmm. So the bare skid mitt uh, generates a cooling profile, yes. And uh, of course you, you can gate, gouge the steel mm -hmm. because the, the steel is soft. Yeah? And, but what you see, is that uh, the temperature, yes, when we roll the material, yeah, so the skids are in this direction, yes, and when we roll, and, and these uh, areas are slightly cooler, yes, when we roll the material, yes, these, the, the presence of these cooler zones uh, is still visible. Hmm? So you see the uh, the uh, the temperature here, yes, is uh, has some minima, yes. That is due to these these zones that are rolled out, yes. And again, um, when you look at the uh, material after finishing rolling, you still see these variations in the uh, temperature, which are due to the cooling from these uh, skid pipes. Hmm? About uh, the oxidation, by the way, yeah? um, the gas burners can never be directly on the slab, although the temperature of the, the flame temperature is very high, right? It would, uh, from a point of view of heating up the slab, it wouldn't be a bad idea. However, uh, these um, uh, these turn the oxide into a liquid, yes? So you see here uh, that uh, the, in, in this iron uh, oxygen uh, diagram, I have here a point where the uh, liquid, I can form liquid um, uh, oxide. Hmm? And of course the flame itself can easily be uh, as I showed you, over 1300 and 1400 degrees or much higher, right? Yeah. Um, much higher than this. So you, w d normally the slab temperature yes, is about, so this would be a maximum slab temperature. Yeah? So you see the, the, the scale yes, is, is solid. Yeah? If, you, if you would have the gas burner uh, too close to the slab surface, you would get liquid uh, oxides, and this gives a, uh, a uh, very uh, um, uh, problematic surface defect called, called a burn, a surface burn, mm -hmm. a crazed surface appearance. Yeah? So that's an, a no-no. Yeah, we, we never do this, have liquid oxide uh, floating on the, um, on the slabs. Mm -hmm. so one of the first thing we do in, uh, in our hot strip mill is descale. We re we're going to remove the, the oxide. That's the idea of uh, descaling. Remove oxide, uh, which is formed by thermal corrosion of steel. And, and of course, that's absolutely necessary in terms of surface quality and also because you cannot really roll anything that has two or three millimeters of scale on top of this, right? Um, so. The first descaling will exercise will be uh, remove the uh, primary uh, scale, hmm? which is formed in the reheating furnace. We can do this by in the uh, vertical scale breaker or in the early horizontal melts in the um, in the um, hot strip mill, and it's removed by high pressure water. Hmm? 
2,000 to uh, 6,000 PSI. I'll give you some uh, uh, non-US uh, pressures in a moment. And uh, the, we also have secondary scale to take care of, in the, but that's formed during the uh, rolling process. That's much thinner, yes, but it's also removed with high pressure water ahead and usually ahead of the finishing mill. Mm -hmm. So they're less thick and they're also easier to remove. And finally, we also have a final uh, a scale that is formed on the coiled material and that is removed by chemical means, yeah, by in the pickling lines, and we'll discuss that uh, separately. So scale breakers break the scale. You can see here what is called a vertical scale breaker. Uh, if you, you can see perhaps this thing here, that's a, a roll, yes, a roll that rolls against the sides of the uh, of the, uh, the slab to crack, to literally crack the oxide, hmm? so that the uh, descaling is very efficient. Hmm? Hmm? And this is uh, a picture I'll show you uh, 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 a cross section in a moment, yes? You, uh, the, the strip, uh, actually you can't see it, but it passes through this box here, this descaler, uh, you have here these two uh, pipes here are the heads of the descaler. You have, you have to descale it of, of on top and on the bottom. Yeah. And, uh, and you have uh, pinch rolls here and scale breakers. Um, pinch rolls are, are just rolls that prevent all the water that you're... Uh, uh, that, that you're... Um, um, directing to the strip surface is, is, uh, is ca caught and recycled. Hmm? So here you have a descaler after the reheating furnace, a very high pressure water. So on the inside of this box, you have the strip goes in and you have these, the spray headers, one here, one here, and at the bottom you, s you have them too. Yes? And you have this very high uh, water pressure um, in pinches at the surface and then is that uh, captured again for re to recycle the water. Right? There are uh, one, also you'll see in a moment, the, one, the, the way the, uh, uh, you remove the scale basically by, with this high pressure water, yes? um, you like to have uh, reduced the size of these uh, descalers and also um, inc increase their capacity to descale using a very small amount of water. Yes, and so there are new descalers are, are being used in certain lines, in particular in mini mills or so-called CSP mills or rotary descalers. So instead of having uh, uh, a stationary uh, uh, descaler heads, you now have rotary arms, yes? So this is the side view, this is the strip comes in, and here you have these rotary arms that provide the high pressure water, and they, they, they turn around the surface. Hmm? So you have much higher uh, efficiency of descaling, less temperature losses because you need, you're using less water. Hmm? And also very much fewer nozzles compared to a conventional descaler. Where, where do we put these scalers? Anytime we have built up enough scale. So there is a, um, in a continuous a standard hot strip mill, after the furnace you have a scale breaker and then you always have a, uh, a descaler before the hot strip and before the finishing, uh, before the roughing, excuse me, and before the finishing uh, mill. Okay. Right. So, um, so these these are in, in bars. These are very high pressures. You know, you're talking about uh, the order of hundred bars, hmm? and the the uh, the headers and the nozzles look like this. You have a very large amount of nozzles on this header. Hmm? 
Okay. Now, the effectiveness of the, um, the descaling. So first of all, the descaling is not a, uh, an effect of the temperature. Yes, so that, um, some people say, well, you know, you have cold water, a very hot oxide, and you get thermal stresses, and that makes it. It's not like that. It's uh, really the physical impact of the water. Yes. So the, the, the pressures are very important. Hmm? So for instance, if you uh, look at the effectiveness of the uh, removal of the scale, yes, it increases with pressure. Yes. Yeah. And um, if you lose less water, which is something you want to do because it has an impact on your operating costs, yes, smaller water volumes, you have to increase the pressure. Hmm? That's why these scalers, the trend in these scalers to use to make them more compact, higher pressure and less use of water. Hmm? Descaling force, yes, uh, depends on two main factors, the pressure, actually the square root of the pressure, and the amount of water per unit time. Hmm? And the effectiveness of the scaling depends on other Many other parameters like the nozzle angle, distance to the strip, strip speed, offset angle, etc. We'll see in the next. Hmm? And we talk about impact force during this scale is the force divided by the width and length of the impact area. Hmm? So this scaling is not, again, the thermal shock effect of cold water on the hot strip. is really due to the impingement force which breaks the bond between the oxide and the steel. Hmm? Uh, if the impingement force or water uh, volume is too high, you will get undesirable uh, cooling. So there are advantages using less water. Hmm? Operating cost, uh, recycling of the water, plus less uh, heat loss. Hmm? Um, so, uh, so this is what happens. The, the water uh, physically uh, removes and breaks the bond between the oxides and, and lifts up, delaminates the oxide scale. Hmm? This is a um, typical uh, setup. The, the position of these headers is very critical. Right? The, uh, right. There's some, uh, before I go there. So th what you need is to break the uh, oxide metal bond and lift off the scale. Mm -hmm. And the water spray basically goes under the scale and applies enough force to break off the scale. Mm -hmm. And so having scale that already has some cracks in it is very uh, useful. And that's why we always install oxide breakers yeah, because they will, will cause the presence uh, that will result in cracks being present in the, um, in the scale before you start the high pressure descaling. Hmm? So you can have vertical and horizontal scale breakers. Hmm? So these parameters here, the position of these headers, the, uh, the angles, the overlap area, that these uh, sprays may very critical, yes? And uh, it's, it's uh, here you see typical uh, distances yeah, are about 12 inch, it's about 25 centimeters. Um, the, this angle beta here is between 10 and 15 degrees, yes? Um, yeah, so you uh, so these pr and, and the, the, the zone, the overlap, and, the, and these angles are all very, uh, you know, it's a science in itself uh, to, um, to provide and install and keep uh, in good order uh, the descalers, right? So, um, and they have a major impact on the, uh, on the surface quality. One of the things you never want to have in a hot strip mill is roll in the scale, right? You don't want any, any residue of, uh, of it to, um, to remain on the surface. Okay, so um, we're at uh, 12.15, so I'll, uh, I'll close here. And uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, 
we will uh, continue with the discussion of the, uh, the, the roughing mill and uh, structure of the roughing mill and what happens when uh, we do rough rolling. Thank you.